Yeah. So we can move on to preparing the discs. So what I'm going to do before we go on to this is to get my terminal up. So this is the terminal on the local machine, on the modern machine. And I'm going to do SSH. Use the right keyboard. So SSH and the IP address that I got from the remote machine, the, the machine that I want to build on. So as you can see, it's 192.168.0.71. So that's how I'm going to connect to it. 192.168.0.71. And I need to connect as root because that's the only user on there. So I need to put in root at. And yeah, it can't be authenticated. Uh, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, put my password in and there you go so you can see that we've got the um, Gen 2 minimal CD welcome message <clears throat> and we've got the live CD prompt so we know we now access the remote machine uh, via SSH now I can do something like LS CPU to view the uh, processors and this again will confirm it i686 architecture, 32-bit, it's an authentic AMD, and there you can see it's an Athlon MP2400+. Plus. And you can also see there's two CPUs online with two sockets, so it's definitely the right machine I've connected to. Um, interestingly, when I tested this, I did a quick test at, um, you know, to get times and so on. Uh, the kernel I built, it must be slightly newer, or maybe I've got different settings. I didn't think there were any vulnerabilities. Um, so whether this has now been mitigated or, or yeah, I don't know what. I, I don't remember seeing this. So I'd be interested to see when I get this up and running again um, to see what that says for this spec, spec store bypass. But you'll notice this is a 20, uh, what is it? 23 yeah about a 17 year old machine 16 17 year old machine and it's not affected by some of the vulnerabilities that have been discovered recently whereas had it been a intel pentium 4 probably um i believe that it has got at least two of these vulnerabilities that um uh, have been discovered so uh, it seems that AMD have got off a little bit lightly here with the these um, vulnerabilities that have been discovered. But as you can see, these Spectre V1 and V2, it has got those, but they've been mitigated in the in the kernel. Um, so let's carry on. Yep. So introduction to block device. So it, it describes various ways of storing the operating system various block devices you've got the nvm express traditional sata sas or scusi or even usb flash devices um, embedded device storage devices and traditional um, ide parallel ata devices now in actual fact the hda uh, references is only if you're using an older kernel with the older or, or not so much the older kernel but the unsupported or deprecated um, ATA drivers will give you this HDA designation in dev. The modern ones will give you SDA designations for all SATA and all PATA uh, devices. Um, so it's very unlikely you'll see this. If you do see that, I would seriously consider looking at the kernel configuration uh, and using the modern uh, SCSI subsystem. Um, or it means you're using a very old kernel, which um, is probably not a good thing. So partition tables, as I said, are uh, going to be using the MBR uh, DOS sector, boot sector, um, just for, well, main reason is I'm not 100% sure that GPT, the GUID partition table, will work with BIOS. Um, it says here that what the situation is for modern motherboards but um, 
not really with the other way around. So I will be using MBTs, uh, MBR, sorry, I don't know why I keep calling them MBTs. Uh, I won't be using GPTs. It says a bit here about advanced storage with BTRFS and LVM. Not going to be bothered with that. Um, not going to be obviously using their partitioning scheme because GPT requires a BIOS boot partition. Uh, UEFI needs uh, an EFI partition. Um, so I'm just going to skip through all this. You're obviously quite welcome to read through this if you want to do something different or if you're using UEFI. Um, I won't be using Parted either because you only really need to use that for GPT, really, I suppose, and setting labels. Um, MBRs don't use labels. So I'm just going to skip that. Right, so I'm going to use FDisk, but again, I'm not going to be using this layout. I'll just be basically using this layout with a, swap, a boot, a swap, and a root. Um, it does say that FDisk does support GPT, which is true, but it says it's still shown to have some issues with it. So the instructions below are for using MBR. So let's type FDisk minus L. And you can see I've got all these loop devices and RAM devices, all part of the fact that I've booted from the minimal CD, so just ignore them. But you can see I've got one disk in here. It's 500 gigabytes. So I'm going to do F disk as it says in the book, SDA, uh, sorry, slash dev, slash SDA. And that will take us into the F disk program. Type P and it will show you the current layout. Um, looks like I've already had some stuff on here previously because it's already got an MBT partition. Um, but you can set a partition up. You can choose the type of partition label. With G, if you want to set a GPT, there's a couple of obviously an SGI, IRIX, or some partition table. I'm going to create a new partition, a new DOS or MBR partition table. So that will mean that this identifier will change because I'm going to rewrite a new one. So I'll just do O, and it tells me that it's created the new identifier. So if I now do P, you can see that new identifier has been displayed down there. So, um, I'm just going to go through and do this. Um, you can go through here and read all about it if you wish. Um, I'm not going to spend time going through here. Reason being, it's just so personal. It depends on your system, depends what other disks you've got in, it depends on how you're booting. Uh, there's so many options. So I'm just going to create a layout that suits me. It suits this uh, demonstration that I'm doing. I'm just going to do a basic basic layout. So I'm just going to do N for new partition. I'm going to accept the default P for primary. Accept the default the first partition. Accept the default the first sector. Now the first partition I'm creating is the boot partition. So this is where the kernel gets stored. And I'm going to give it a size of 128 meg. So I'll just do plus 128. And FDisk works out how many sectors that equates to. So plus one two eight M, and you can see it tells me it's created uh, one partition, partition number one. It's defaulted it to a Linux partition type, and it's given it the size I requested of 128 megabytes. So if I now do P to print the table, you can see it's calculated the start sectors and the end sectors, and you can see if you calculate that and the number of sectors, that will equal exactly 128 megabytes which you can see there, and there's the type, the ID number 83, and the Linux type. If you're doing GPT tables, the IDs and the descriptions are a little bit different, so don't be worried if, if you find that, um, I can't remember what the GPT is now, but um, it's a different number, it might be 24 or something, I can't remember what it is. So now I'm going to create a swap partition, so I'll do N for new again, Again, set the default P for primary. Set the default is the next one it's going to allocate for me. Again, set the default sector, start sector. And I'm going to give it, um, well, the minimum it said is 256. I'll give it 512 megabytes, which is a reasonable amount. 
So that's roughly a quarter of the memory I've got. It doesn't really need to be any bigger because if it starts swapping, it's really going to start slowing down. So 512 is just giving me a little bit of headroom to recover if anything does start going astray. So if I now print that up, uh, you can see that second partition's there. Uh, 5 on 12 megabytes, but this is what I wanted to be my swap partition, but it says it's going to, uh, or it's been labelled as a, uh, a Linux partition, so I need to change that. So to do that, you can do T to change the type. It asks me which partition I want to change. I want to change the second one, partition 2. So it's actually defaulted to 2, but I can put that in anyway. If you're not sure what the code is for the partition you want to change to, you can do L and if you look down here you can see the default 83 is what it's set to at the moment but I want a Linux swap partition so I need to change it to 82 so that's what I'm going to type in 82 and it tells me that it's changed that partition from Linux to Linux swap slash Solaris so now if I do P you can see it's now changed that type it's just an identifier I don't think it has any uh, bearing on anything else, certainly not when you come to format the partitions. So now we're going to create the actual root file system. So do n again, set the default primary. It knows the next three partition number is three. So I'll take that first sector except the default and I want to fill the rest of the disk up so I'm just going to set the default again which will be the last sector and you can see it's created a new partition that's uh, approximately it's going to be approximately 500 gigabytes in decimal but in binary it's 465 gigabytes so if I do P again you can see there's my three partitions I've got a 128 meg boot partition 512 megabyte swap partition and approximately 465 gigabytes root file system. So now we need to format these partitions and again in the handbook it explains different um, uh, file systems you can format map them to and the various benefits and so on. I'm going to be using ext4 um, as that's the newest EXT, it's like the bread and butter file system for Linux. Um, this is interesting. Um, I'm not sure which of these are installed by default, but it's worth bearing in mind if you do choose one of these other file systems, you may need to install uh, appropriate tools to allow them to work. Um, in fact, it says it looks like they're all on here by default anyway, but it's worth knowing that these uh, other packages, um, what, 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 what it is that supplies the functionality. So it does look like out, out of the box on this minimal CD, you can format to any one of these file systems. So, so I'm going to be formatting to ext4. So first of all, I've got to write these changes to the disk. I'm still in fdisk here. So just do W, press enter, you can see the partition table has been altered. So if I now do fdisk minus L, you can see the partition table has now exists for this disk identifier. So let's partition these, MKFS. I'm going to format the boot partition as ext2. Um, I have done ext4 in the past. The only thing is it creates a journal. It takes up a little bit of extra space on such a small partition. The partition doesn't get written to very often. The only time it gets written to is when you're updating the kernel. So <clears throat> it's not that big a deal that you may need to recover from the journal in case of a power cut or corruption or something. Um, when it gets mounted, you probably only normally want to mount it as read-only anyway. Certainly, the, when we set up the boot, boot of uh, the booting of Gen 2, it will be mounted as read-only. Um, so it's it's probably probably best. I mean, it's up to you. You can set it to ext4. Like I say, you'll lose a little bit of space, but 
I'm just going to set it up as ext2. That'll do me. Um, and just specify the uh, partition number. If you have got multiple disks on your system, just double check that you are referencing the right disk because you'll end up formatting um, something else if you're not careful. As this is the only disk I've got connected in the system, then it's pretty straightforward. I've just got to bear in mind what partitions I'm uh, formatting and not have to worry about which disk. So I'm going to format that. This should be fairly straightforward, fairly quick. It's just got to load the program off the CD-ROM. Yeah, that was quick. I'm going to recall that command, change it to STA3, uh, but this time I'm going to use ext4 for the main root file system. And it's take a little bit longer as it's got more data structures to create and write. So as you can see, this is uh, um, taking a little bit longer because of the nature and the age of the machine hardware that I'm using. One of the negative things about this particular server board is the memory speed. It's uh, all the uh, front side bus speed and, and the memory speed as well, I think. It's only on a, I think, 133 megahertz clock, I think. Around this time, Pentiums were coming out on 200 megahertz, so it's probably that's probably restricting it a little bit is the speed of the memory, but um, that's just one of those things. So that's done. So basically, we've done almost the same as what they've got here. The, the partitioning is different because they've created a um, EFI partition which I've not done. So the last thing I want to do is to create a swap drive, but obviously it's not SDA3, it's going to be SDA2 for me. Um, so just do mk swap slash dev slash SDA2. As simple as that. And as you can see, we can turn the swap on. I don't think it's necessary got two gigabytes is more than enough for the installation part but I'll turn it on anyway swap on dev sda2 and it's done um, one thing I'm going to do is to create a copy of these UUIDs is quite useful if you want to um, if you're using I think it's more important if you're using GPT um, you can boot using UUIDs. Um, so I'm going to copy this information in case I decide to uh, configure the system to boot using UUIDs. And I'm just going to create a file with this information on. and paste this in. So this one was for slash def slash sda1. So that's the boot partition. This is sta3 which is the root file system. and dev sda2 which is the swap so like I, said, I, I don't know if I'll be using them yet but I'll keep a record of them as I think if you're using UFI is it mandatory I'm not sure if it's mandatory but it's advisable that's that's for sure um, it's probably advisable in any case in case you add and remove disks the SDA 
SDB etc designation can change depending on the order of the disks whereas the UUID is by its very definition unique so it will never change. So now what we've got to do is to mount our root file system using this command here. So mount slash dev slash hda3 for mine not sda4 and we mount this onto a gen2 partition which has already been created for us. Um, be, bear in mind not to mount anything at the mount directory because the live CD has been mounted there, the image has been mounted there and if you mount it at the mount directory you'll hide everything in the live CD directory and you'll find you've got access to none of the commands and nothing will work. Um, I know because I've done it and you probably will make the mistake if you, if you forget. Uh, so just bear that in mind. If, if you need to mount something uh, like a pen drive or something just create another directory and mount it into that subdirectory that you create where, whether it be in the MNT directory or elsewhere so that's the uh, root file system that's been mounted it says here note if temp needs to reside in a separate partition be sure to change its permissions after mounting so if you have got a separate temp directory and you're managing it now then you need to change the access permissions it looks like it's accessible by anyone I think that's with the sticky bit that first one um, to make sure that only uh, users that create files are the ones that, that can delete the files in temp um, it says later on in the instructions prop file system which is a virtual interface with the kernel as well as other kernel pseudo file systems we mounted first but first we install the Gen 2 installation files. 